I don't know. Say it with me. I don't know. Good God, it is liberating. I am a towering mountain of ignorance. I don't know. We're taught to believe that everything has a reason. Now, I'm glad that we have the desire to understand the world. That results in all sorts of great stuff. We want to know everything. We're humans. We're curious. And maybe it's our culture. Maybe it's just humanity. But I think a lot of the time we end up mixing up thinking something with knowing something. Suddenly, I know that I don't know. But somehow, everyone else seems to know. They all know differently from each other, but they all seem to know. What I'm saying is nobody's opinions are correct in the world. And yet, it's impossible not to tie your opinions to your concept of self. And often, people tie those things so closely together that they begin defending their guesses as if they're defending their very lives. In a way, they are. This is why it can be so impossible to talk about certain topics with certain people. They've tied those suppositions to themselves so tightly with knots of narrative and constructed reality and values that there's just no one tying it. And maybe, unsurprisingly, in those situations, the best course of action is just to be friends. The world as we perceive it as we've built it inside of ourselves is a lie that we tell to ourselves not out of deception but out of necessity we simply cannot understand the world as it is and so we construct but sometimes i just have to tell myself the thing that is definitely true the truest thing i can say which is that i don't know This is the Everyone's Agnostic Podcast with Bob Pondillo and Cass Midgley. You know, it's been a journey. It's been a long journey. I had a very positive relationship with God for many years. I went through the death of a spouse. I went through various things where faith carried me through, and it was very important to me. Slowly over time, as my world was expanded, I you know, started to travel, live outside the U.S., meet other people. I mean, it wasn't until I was probably in my 30s that I remember having conversations with people who said, I'm agnostic. And I was kind of like, what's that mean? Yeah. And then to have a conversation with a real atheist was a was a big deal. And then I was like, these people are really fun to talk to. Like, <laughs> let's let's talk and explore some more. Welcome, everyone, to episode 175 of the Everyone's Agnostic Podcast. I'm Cass Midgley. Today, Dr. Bob Pondillo and I talk with Lisa. She Skyped in from the Netherlands, and she and her husband are U.S. diplomats. She was raised as a Seventh-day Adventist in rural Pennsylvania. She became an SDA pastor and was a chaplain at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And it's just in the past year that Lisa has begun identifying as, quote, solidly agnostic. Lisa's lived outside the U.S. since 2012. She lost her first husband to brain cancer and was struck by lightning while rock climbing in the French Alps. She's an adventurer. She hikes, rides horses, sails, scuba dives, and paraglides. She is currently building her leadership and life coaching practice online at www.lisa-hope.com. She enjoys helping people connect with themselves, with the people they love, and with their own purpose, which sounds like great tools for post-faith people. We lost our Skype connection with Lisa near the very end and couldn't get back to her, so the interview is cut off cold with no goodbyes. In the show notes, there's links to her GoPro videos of her adventures and her website, lisa-hope.com. Before we get into our talk with Lisa... I want to thank everyone who's responded so kindly and gratefully to my candidness about my own depression on this podcast. As you probably know, I don't believe in being ashamed for the human condition, even the more pathological traits, however that manifests in your life. We're all a little crazy, so judges and haters and superiors can take it somewhere else. My story is that I was diagnosed this last January with clinical depression, something I've probably had my whole life but was intensified by the difficult task of learning how to live without God, happening alongside my emergence into midlife and some arrested developments that were largely attributable to Christianity. In my case, the depression became severe enough that I sought outpatient help at Vanderbilt Psychiatric Hospital. 
participated in group and personal therapy, and was prescribed antidepressant and mood-stabilizing medications, which have helped me tremendously, and everyone that has to deal with me on a regular basis. My particular symptoms are like an uncontrollable, swirling vortex of thoughts, fearful and daunting and contradictory most of the time, that produce acute anxiety which for me manifests as a pit in my stomach and the unconscious need to take deep breaths every now and then, about every 15 minutes. In addition to meds, I also benefit from some practical techniques that are designed to rein in the madness. You can Google cognitive therapy for a world of ideas and tools on this issue. One that I highly recommend if you're experiencing anxiety or stress or unease as a result of racing thoughts is an app for your phone called Headspace. It's basically a three or four minute guided daily meditation. They also have little videos that give you tools to better understand what's happening. Here's an example of one that's only a minute long. Training the mind is often quite different to how people imagine it to be. Maybe they have an idea it's about stopping thoughts or eliminating feelings. But the reality is a bit different. An easy way to think of it is to imagine yourself sitting on the side of a busy road, the passing cars representing the thoughts and the feelings. All you have to do is to sit there and watch the cars. Sounds easy, right? But what usually happens is that we feel a bit unsettled by the movement of the traffic. So we run out into the road and try and stop the cars, or maybe even chase after a few, forgetting that the idea was to just sit here. And of course, all of this running around only adds to the feeling of restlessness in the mind. So training the mind is about changing our relationship with the passing thoughts and feelings. Learning how to view them with a little more perspective. And when we do this, we naturally find a place of calm. Will we sometimes forget the idea of the exercise and become distracted? Of course we will. But as soon as we remember, here we are, back on the side of the road again just watching the traffic go by, perfectly at ease in both body and mind. So there's a healthy way of thinking about overthinking, thanks to Headspace. I apologize if you're super mentally healthy and this doesn't apply to you, but again, I think we're all a little crazy and there's no shame in it. Please don't shrink back from seeing a shrink or even talking very honestly with trusted friends. The talking is where the healing happens. It goes from being a foggy pinball game in your brain with 40 ball bearings at once to tangible, comprehensible, linear sequences of thoughts that march out sentence by sentence, each one taking off from the shoulders of the prior so that you can climb your way out of the deep, dark well of confusion and depression. Somehow the poisonous potency of untruths and half-truths are diluted and dispelled by just talking out loud. I also recommend getting a voice recorder app on your phone, putting on earbuds with the microphone in the wire, and take walks while talking to yourself. My app has a setting for skip silence so that it only records when I'm talking, which removes any pressure created by long contemplative silences between orations. And go outside. Green helps our moods and has a calming effect on our minds and emotions. And if you're walking around talking to yourself in a semi-public place like a greenway or something, people will just think you're talking on the phone. It happens all the time. I know this is a bit prescriptive and preachy, so I hope that it's not too big a turnoff. I just know what's helped me. Which brings me to my last tip and something I'm deeply grateful to have found. And that's some kind of creative outlet. Painting, poetry, music, carpentry, pottery, cooking. Something that you can engage with as artistic, free from judgment. And yet, it calls you to excellence. For me, it's this podcast. It doesn't hurt that it helps other people too, but your creative outlet may be something that only you know about or benefit from. In summary, life is hard. In fact, it's meaningless even according to the Bible. And by connecting with yourself, with your body, with nature, with friends, with your sexuality, with your personal interests, with comedy and laughter, with food, with libations in moderation, you protect yourself from depression and anxiety and stress. Do something 
that can give your otherwise meaningless life some color, some joy, some serenity. Just do it. Grab your agency back from God. Let yourself grow up where Christianity stunted your maturation. Let yourself be childlike where you've taken life too serious. Say yes to what it means to be you and bring that unique expression of chromosomes that is you to the rest of us so we can love on you. And try not to be a dick. I'm working on that too. We taped this conversation on September 30th, 2017. We interview people you don't know about a subject no one wants to talk about. We hope to encourage people in the process of deconstructing their faith and help curb the loneliness that accompanies it. We think the world is a better place when more people live by sight, not by faith. Subscribe to our podcast and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, you can support us monetarily in two easy ways. You can pledge $1 per episode or more through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash EA podcast. Or you can leave a lump sum donation through PayPal at our website, everyonesagnostic.com. If you're on the journey of questioning your faith and would benefit from a community of fellow travelers, we have a private support group on Facebook. Friend me on Facebook, private message me that you'd like to be added, and give me a bit of your story because I screen applicants briefly to protect the confidentiality of the group. Our opening monologue is an excerpt from a YouTube by Hank Green. The music behind it is Never Know by Jack Johnson. The segue music on this episode is created by the Barry Orchestra, found at barryorchestra.bandcamp.com. Thanks for listening, and be a yes-sayer to what is. Hello. <laughs> nice to see your face. Nice to see you. <laughs> I'm really excited about this. A little nervous too, but very excited. So thanks for having me. I know you guys don't really know anything about me, so it'll be great. Uh, so are we? What are you going to go by today? Your whole name, or just does it matter? Do I want to do this with my real name? But I do. I definitely do. But okay. you can know that it, it was something I had to think about. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, let's just go there. Are you? You're out of the closet or so to speak with your family or you know i mean <laughs> you know the first time i probably really was like yeah i'm definitely agnostic was less than a year ago okay i've talked to my family along the way i, I mean my one sister she knows i'm doing this and uh definitely wants to listen to it my parents you know my parents i probably won't invite them to listen to this mainly because they don't like swearing and i know that there's going to be swearing <laughs> and i and i respect that but i i wouldn't i i don't feel the desire to like hide my story although i partially like with my parents yeah. would it disrupt them enough like i don't feel the need to go and be like okay. look guys we can go with an, a non explicit show no problem yeah yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know as an option because with my parents, like I'm just like they just and, and they're they're older. Like my dad's 85, and you know it's just how they grew up. And I uh, I get it. I used to hate swearing. And <laughs> is there a reason because you're not 85? So <laughs> why well, did you hate swearing? Well, it's just, I, grew, uh, I mean I just grew up without it. And honestly, I worked for the church, so I became a pastor. And I like to say. Working for the church drove me to swear and drink. I didn't swear or drink before I came, became a pastor. <laughs> well, let's let's go back there to um, That's funny. to your childhood. You were raised Seventh Day Adventist. I really, I mean, thinking back to my childhood, I had a nice childhood. Grew up in rural Pennsylvania. I grew up on a farm. I went to public school, which was a little bit different for Adventist kids. A lot of Ad, the Adventist church has a significant education system from elementary all the way through university mm -hmm. hey. so a lot of kids just go to adventist schools their whole entire life i went to public school up through eighth grade and you know kind of stood out as a kid because adventists go to church on saturday the sabbath starts friday night at sundown goes to saturday night on, at sundown mm -hmm. and so i wouldn't go to parties you know birthday parties on friday night Saturday, and that's when most of them were. Mm -hmm. So I kind of stood out a little bit. I didn't eat pepperoni. Adventists don't eat pork. They just do 
you know, so yeah, first grade, I was the only kid on pizza day who would want cheese pizza when there was pepperoni pizza as an option. Mm-hmm. Didn't um, know that. Yeah, wow. Wow. yeah. What part of rural Pennsylvania were you close to the Pittsburgh side or more to the Philly side? More to the Philly side. Yeah, just south of Allentown. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We- so, and so a girl from Philadelphia, or from at least rural Pennsylvania, uh, is yeah. now. We're talking to you from the Netherlands. Is that right? Yep, I now live in the Netherlands. Wow, what time is it there? It is five thirty in the evening. Oh, okay, well, that worked out. Not too bad. Yeah. It's ten thirty Central Time here in in Nashville. Yeah, Murfreesboro. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, awesome. So. Uh, not a, not a whole lot of scar tissue from your church experience. In fact, you went right into ministry. Did you go to school for that, or what? Was there a Seventh Day Adventist college or something? Or? There's there's quite a few. I did not go to school to get into the ministry. I actually have a master's in health science. Okay. So I used to be an occupational therapist, and that's what I originally went to school for. Mm-hmm. I my first husband died in 2005, and that was a major shift in my life. And it was couple years after that that I got a job as a University of Cha- uh, University of Tennessee chaplain in Knoxville. Oh wow. Huh. My daughter graduated from there. Oh, yeah. Okay. So for the, you were the chaplain for the Seventh Day Adventist kids then, I would guess. On yeah, on campus there. Yeah. Oh, wow. How long did you serve there? I was there two and a half years. Yeah. Now isn't the Seventh Day Adventist weren't they the Millerites? The the Miller yep. uh, Yeah. The Millerites, the guy yeah. that thought that the world was gonna end and then it didn't. So then he said, Okay, I made a mistake and then it didn't end again. <laughs> and then he said yeah. then the great disappointment happened <laughs> as I recall. That was eighteen eighteen forty four. Yeah. 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 And you know, yeah. ha- have you noticed there's been a couple of times, at least this year, twice I think, where uh, somebody has said the world's going to end, and of course it hasn't. But boy, that <laughs> that uh, notion of the, the the apocalypse, the end of the world, that is a strong and durable. I mean, idea it keeps happening over and over and over again for, since for like two thousand years. Yeah. It's been happening. People keep yeah. saying, you know, the world is going to end. Yeah. Weird, huh? Well, and. I mean, Seventh-day Adventist, the name comes, I mean, seventh day from going to church on Saturday, that's the Sabbath. But then Adventism, I mean, that's about, that's all about Jesus' second coming. And so, it's a really significant part of Adventist doctrine Mm -hmm. and teaching. I don't know where you guys land on the pre-millennial, post-millennial, you know, like, do you believe in the rapture as an Adventist or any of that stuff? Not a rapture. Um... The basic sequence is Jesus comes back Mm -hmm. and the righteous are raised, those who are dead are raised from the dead because they believe, Adventists believe in a, you you sleep when you die, you don't go right to heaven or hell. Mm -hmm. So the righteous are raised and all the righteous that are still living, everybody's taken up into heaven for a thousand years. So the millennium, all of these people are in heaven Satan is bound to the earth during those thousand years, and that's like misery for him. And then (laughs) there's this return where heaven comes to earth, Mm -hmm. and the earth is made new, and then all of the the non-saved dead are raised up. And the image that we're given is that there's going to be this whole army uh, with Satan leading them, and they're all going to try and come attack the kingdom of heaven, you know, that's come. And and then and then there's final de- destruction. So Adventists are annihilationists. So it's complete and final destruction of Satan and all of his evil angels all, all and all people. of the wicked people, all the lost people. Wow. Mm-hmm. So yeah. they don't don't actually go to hell. They just, just they die. Well, at Adventists. I, I remember specifically in talking about this and being taught about this. Um, one of the pastors was like. It's it really catches people's attention if you tell them that Adventists we believe in a hell seven times hotter than than your eternal hell because the hell we believe in burns up everything forever. <laughs> so my gosh, yeah. kind of interesting. But that the, you know <laughs> it is kind of it's this idea of hell, but it's almost once it's gone, it's done. Yeah, that yeah. Makes sense. maybe that thousand years is hell. Well, it's but it's really only hell for Satan and his evil angels because oh. all the other, oh, the lost other they're still are dead. still <laughs> sleeping. How many in their angels grave? dance on the head of a pin? You yeah, know what I mean? I mean, right. it's just what a story, man! You guys are creative. That is Somebody. that is one. 
hell of a great. So this means uh, then Seventh Day Adventists w- won't be cremated. Sort of traditionally, but but it's not a real firm thing. And I grew up. My dad wants to be cremated, and I we've known that. I mean, I've known that for uh, since I was a little girl, and I remember talking to my mom about it. And for a while, she didn't, and I think she's moved to a place where she wants to be cremated too. So, so Adventist. I mean, in essence, it doesn't matter because God's going to bring you back yeah, from he'll, he'll, ashes or sure. whatever. Sure. Well, that's yeah. all that's left of people that have been dead hundreds of years anyway. So. Yeah. Well, that's right. true. If you're yeah. going to believe that God can raise you from Why the dead. Why not? Yeah, sure. Wacky, wacky yeah. shit. Puts and in a like way, it. I mean, like, so I, in listening to other people's stories on the podcast, like, a lot of people have this, t- I mean, fear and dread of hell. And I don't, I've never, I never had that. In a way, I'm I'm like, well, I prefer that belief. If you're going to believe along any of these lines, I kind of prefer the belief that people are just completely destroyed because yeah. When I I thought about this for a while years ago and was like, I believe that all life comes from God. And so, like, eternal torment, people, God would have to keep people alive just to torment them. Like, that's messed up. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I was like, wow, I'm really glad we don't believe that. It makes better sense that sure. God would essentially shut off his life force from people. Yeah. That's how I, I kind of reasoned it in my own head. Yeah. And then they would naturally, well, I don't know, disappear die well I, I was raised a liberal presbyterian where they didn't really emphasize hell yeah and, okay. and then i became a baptist who totally emphasized oh, yeah, hell almost yeah. every sermon had to do with hell right yeah and, and then as i matured i thought you know what i'm an annihilationist i don't believe that god's gonna do that and that mm-hmm. but they the lost would die mm-hmm. in fact i used john three sixteen to justify that because it says for for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so believing in him is the prerequisite to everlasting life. Oh, and yeah. so if you, you have an un- all that other stuff. if you have an unregenerate soul, then you just die. Right. Uh, and so I, that was annihilationism. And then I went to universalism, to where everybody's <laughs> saved. No matter, yeah. you know, no matter what, yeah. and then I just I, I ditched the whole the whole concept. <laughs> I've been I've I've been there at the universalist. Yeah, yeah. it's part of the yeah. steps. So, yeah. so uh, Lisa, you said you've uh, how'd you put it? You um, are sort of a more solid agnostic, not an atheist. So, uh, why? <laughs> just you know, yeah. is the question, I suppose. Yeah. So, you know, it's been a journey. It's been a long journey. I had a very positive relationship with God for many years. Mm -hmm. I, you know, went through the death of a spouse. I went through various things where faith carried me through, and it was very important to me. And slowly over time, as my world was expanded, I have you know, started to travel, live outside the U.S., meet other people, talk to other, you know, I I mean, it wasn't until I was probably in my 30s that I remember having conversations with people who said, I'm agnostic. And I was kind of like, what's that mean? (laughs) And, and then to have a conversation with a real atheist was a, was a big deal. And then I was like, these people are really fun to talk to. Like, (laughs) let's, let's talk and explore some more. And I came to a place I remember saying at one point, ah, I learned about humanism. And I was like, well, I'm a Christian humanist. Yep, me too. I did. Yep. (laughs) You know, John, who's my husband now, he's like, that's not possible. And I'm like, sure it is. Like, I believe in God, but I don't think people have to believe in God and, you know, to do good and, you know, be good in the world. And, 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 you know, so I went down that road and I – came to a place where I was like, I choose to believe in God. I have no way to prove that God exists or that he doesn't exist. I kind of consciously said, believing in God makes my life better. So why wouldn't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For a long time, that's where I was. And it was, it was comfortable. And it's hard for me to even, I, I can't pinpoint it. I'll tell you that. Yeah. And yet over the last year, 18 months, there's just been this place of I feel very much at peace, not saying I believe in God. Like, I don't know. I don't know if God exists. I don't know if he doesn't exist. And, it, and it, you know, two years ago, I was in a course where we were talking about adult development theory. And one of the things that came out in some of the more advanced stages of adult development 
was this idea that we create our own realities. Right. And that really stuck with me. And I was like, well, that's kind of what I've been saying about the God thing. Like, yeah, I'm creating that reality that God exists. Mm-hmm. And and it makes my life better. And, yeah, and you can't prove it one way or the other. So, so why what's not, wrong with yeah, that? Why not have a security blanket yeah. or something that makes you feel better? Yeah. No harm done. And then one of my one of our friends, uh, my husband was talking to him, and he he quote he quoted me. He kind of told you know our friend that I say this, and our friend said, "Well, to me, not believing in God makes my life better." Ah, uh, yeah. And it really struck me, and I was like, "Interesting." Like I had never thought about it like that, but I was like, "That's valid." Like I I'm not going to try to convince him or anybody else to believe in God. Like if not believing in God makes your life better. Sure. Please don't believe in God. And here I am now. I I think I just sit in this place of recognizing we as humans, we create our our realities, our beliefs. It's just neurons firing in our brains. And we get so wrapped up in it. And we get so like, this is the way it is. And, And I used to be there. And my life is so much more enjoyable not being there and just being like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm happy not knowing. I don't, I don't. <laughs> right. what, whatever great. you need to believe, you believe. Whatever I believe, I believe. And so that's where wow. I am now. All right. So in, in answering Bob's question, you're saying the agnostic thing is a way of me staying true to that. I don't know. And I'm, I just want to stay in that place. Whereas – Maybe to you, atheism sounds like more of a certain type, uh, a certainty that you don't yeah. want to. Too much hubris. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, see, I because I'm, I'm kind of off the agnostic thing now, I, I think, oh, they've had enough time to figure this out. <laughs> you know, come on, 2,000 years, give me a break. Yeah. There's nobody. <laughs> no, they're not coming. It's It's chaos. It's chaos, you know, yeah. and that's just the way it is, and, yeah. uh, and I can I can live with that. That's fine. But I do have a question about, um, so you get married, you're young, you come off the farm, you get married, and then really early on in your marriage, your your uh, former husband, your first husband, gets a brain tumor. My yeah. God, that had to be terrible. And then before you know it, he passes away. And uh, and you mentioned that this did help because the the belief in religion did help you uh, traverse that. Can you talk about that? What was that about? How how did you how did the religion help you then? Yeah, so I met Eric when I was nineteen years old, and he was ten years older than me, so he was twenty nine. And at the time, I didn't think anything about it because my parents are ten and a half years apart, and I was like, well, whatever. I, looking back, I'm like. Whoa, I was so young. Oh, my goodness. Where did you meet him? We met at a summer camp. I was, uh, he was a nurse, but he also worked at a summer camp with the horse program. I was, horses were my everything growing up. (laughs) I got my first pony when I was uh, eight years old, and I just lived, breathed, just loved horses. And I worked at a summer camp with a horse program and then went to a training my second year of college where I got certified as an instructor for this summer camp program. And Eric was there. And then he tried to recruit me to come work for him in his horsemanship program at a different camp. And that's, these are all Adventist camps. We, okay. The church has a system of summer camps. And I was like, no, no, no. what are you trying to do? I actually, I worked at a summer camp near you guys, um, Centerville, Tennessee, mm-hmm. Center, oh, yeah. Center Hill, Center, Center Hill. Yeah, yeah, the, the lake, where the lake is, Center Hill Lake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so yeah. the camp is there. And then the following year, I was going to school actually outside Chattanooga. He started calling. Eric was living in Florida at this time. He starts calling me, and long story short, I end up moving to Florida. I finish my occupational therapy program at University of Florida. I get married at 23 and felt like I had it all figured out. I mean, this was – it was easy. I, we were going down this road. Everything looked great. And literally nine months after we were married is when he was diagnosed with his brain tumor. Oh, and. Man. We lived in Florida. We were back in Chattanooga where Eric's family was at the start of a three-week vacation. And we had no idea. He had a headache that he couldn't get rid of. And that's why we went to the emergency room. And 
I remember we're the start of this three week vacation. We're planning also to go to Pennsylvania, see my family. Mm-hmm. We're at his family's. He's not feeling well. I'm feeling irritated because I want to get out. I want to do things, and he's got a headache. And you know, went back to bed. And I think it was probably four o'clock in the afternoon. He comes out and he hands me the keys to the car and he says, "Take me to the hospital." And I'm like, "What do you mean?" And he's like, "Take me to the hospital." So we go. We sit for three hours in the waiting room, and then finally we get in and they do it. it they basically said, yeah, it looks like you have, it really looks like you have a bad sinus headache. Let's give you something for that. And fortunately, Eric, he was a nurse and he looked at the doctor and he's like, it feels like a really bad sinus headache. However, I'm a nurse and I don't come to the ER for a sinus headache. So you better scan my head. So they did a CAT scan. And sure enough, the doctor comes back, really wonderful bedside manner. He holds up the films He says, hey, buddy, you got a big mass in your head. It starts over here in the left frontal lobe, and it crosses over the corpus callosum a little bit on the right frontal lobe as well. And then he looks at me, and he's like, "Uh, do you want me to explain this, or do you want your husband to tell you what's going on? (laughs) Oh, jeez. I was like. My God. uh, Gee, that's terrible. Wow. Yeah, it was was pretty horrific. Fortunately, uh, when the... They consulted the neurosurgeon, and he came, and he had much better bedside manner. Wow! But then they they gave Eric something for pain and and checked him in, you know, put him had him stay overnight. So I stay with him. I start making phone calls uh, to family. I sit in the hospital room with him overnight, and he's completely out of it because of the pain medication they give him. But I don't know this. I'm I'm all of a sudden like. Uh, is it like is this brain tumor like changed him immediately like is he gonna wake is he gonna wake up like it was a horrific experience yeah. mm. and so in the long run he did well i mean he had surgery was able to go back to nursing and it was four and a half years after that that he passed away oh. so i was 28 he had just turned 39 mm-hmm. um the month before he passed away and it's just recently, and I'm, I'm 41 now, so it's been going on 12 and a half, 13 years since he died. And it's really just recently that I am coming to grips with the trauma that I went through in my 20s. Mm. And I think this is a, an interesting perspective of, you know, what faith and religious beliefs can do. But I think because of my religious beliefs, I, there's part of me that didn't acknowledge the trauma like because you just turn things over to god and everything's okay and god's gonna provide and Mm. you i had very strong faith and i believed these things and i went to counseling afterwards i i really dug in like i i had a deep desire to grieve well to Mm -hmm. you know acknowledge this i i dealt with some other issues in you know my marriage wasn't perfect with eric he at the time had, you know, watched, looked at a lot of pornography and I, that was like hit me as a crazy out of the blue. I was a very naive, you know, young woman marrying him and had no exposure to pornography before. So that was really damaging. And I was like, you know, he's got this pornography addiction we're trying to deal with and other things that, you know, when I look back, there was some emotional abuse and, it's been hard to actually address and talk about those sides because when someone's dead, you don't want to necessarily talk bad uh, about them. Yeah, and so it's really tough. It's really tough yeah. to acknowledge both. But there's a part of me that was, you know, the last year of his life that, well, he couldn't function well enough to be on the computer and look at porn. And there was a part of me that was relieved from that and just could shut mm. the door to that right. and, and move on. And, it, you know, it's that, that spiral that goes deeper and deeper and you, you, the layers, you know, peeling back the layers of the onion. Mm -hmm. And every time I process that and go, you go deeper, you find different things. Sure. And so I did as much as I could at the time. And then now it's at a whole different, deeper, greater level. And it's also interesting doing it at the same time as the faith deconstruction. Sure. Well, I think we can safely say that it's a life's work. I mean, there's no such thing as closure to something like that. And and yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's going to come in waves. Yeah. And hell, my dad's been dead for 32 years and, you know, I'm still dealing, you know, with yeah. different different layers of that onion. Mm-hmm. And yeah. yeah, it's okay. 
And I do yeah. think that I think that the deconstruction of faith, now that that's gone, in a way you have to approach this tragic event from a whole other angle. Yeah, from a different set of glasses, yeah. a different set of lenses. And that's yeah. almost yeah. like starting over with a different work. Yeah. You know. And there you know there is uh, not to dwell on this, but there is, you know, I mean, guys are guys. I mean, not all, of them, but oh. you know, clearly. Oh, yeah. But there's something about the visual where we're as guys, I guess, uh, stimulated that way. But when you're you're a Christian and you're a woman, yeah. then you're going to take that personal, right? Yeah, Absolutely. So. And it's wrong. I mean, as a Christian, I mean, looking yeah, at pornography is wrong. It's a sin. And right. I started reading books, and there's all sorts of books written by Christian women whose, you know, husbands have cheated on them emotionally with right, right, pornography. Right. Yeah. And then it always leads to an actual affair, you know, and there's stories. And huh. and it's it's very serious in the the Christian world. Yeah, it's a big deal to them, yeah. Yeah, okay. And it's also, I think the other damage that comes Mm -hmm. is that it's It's so condemned in Christianity and it's so hidden and there's so many Christian leaders who have affairs, have sexual addictions that are damaging to their relationships and their families. And it's one of the things that really started frustrating me because it was like, we can't even talk about these things because you just say, no, it's wrong. And sex outside of marriage is wrong, and you know masturbation is wrong, and pornography is wrong, and it's it's like we can't even have a conversation about this, yeah. and and that's where we go wrong. It is totally wrong. Raising our kids and helping them to make healthy emotional decisions. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure, yeah. That's the. In fact, Cash, you talk about this a lot about why was I created with this this yeah. problem, yeah. <laughs> and then say I'm I'm yeah. Give bad. me a problem and then condemn me for having it. Yeah. Yeah, and and I'm just reading a book right now, uh, written by a family therapist, and she calls this uh, off the tableness or something like that. To where oh, it's off the table. When somebody comes in and says, "This we're going to take this subject off the table," meaning it's forbidden now. Yeah, we're going to censor this conversation, <laughs> and that's incredibly yeah. damaging. And so yeah. yes. this is. I mean, I remember even as a Christian. Well, not even as a Christian, only as a Christian, going to like men support group or accountability group, they would call it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm just an open book. I've just always just been blabbery about everything <laughs> I got. I'm shameless. I really, I don't like secrets. I don't, I don't have any and I love to. Well, to talk about it. Well, so, so when you go to this group, you probably say, oh, yeah, jumped, you know, I masturbate. I, I looked- jumped right in. I was like, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I like, I really, and back yeah. then I would call it a struggle. I'd say yeah. I, I'm struggling with pornography. And honestly, you could just crickets. Like, I mean, you know, as far as yeah, nobody, no, they yeah. didn't want to talk about they it. They wouldn't say anything. Because they all, they all doing the same thing. Well, exactly. You know? I thought that would open them up, but no. Huh? No, because it's, it is this oh, taboo sweet. thing. And they, it's like, you know, it's just saying stop it. As if that's, yeah. you know. <laughs> as if that's going to do it. As if that's already. Don't do that anymore. Yeah. And then go, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I anyway. Yeah, weird. Well, yeah. and I, something that really started shifting my thoughts on this, a friend of mine who was originally from Portugal, but now, you know, was living in the U.S., two boys at the time, they were just about teenagers. And she said, when we go to Portugal and you walk down the street in the cities, all the magazine racks have naked women on the magazine covers and they're not covered up they're not blanked out and she said this gives me an opportunity to talk to my boys about it Hmm. here in the states everything's hidden everything's in the dark it's all secretive and it it makes it more powerful because oh i have to hide and that gives people like a little bit of a high you know to i'm hiding i'm secretive with this and a lot of, I mean, I appreciate living in Europe. I mean, there are just yeah. na- naked beaches, you know, two yeah. kilometers from my house. And it's not a big deal. It's just yeah, yeah, it's, you're it's absolutely right. nakedness. It's humanity. And, and we've objectified and made it so bad. Which yeah. created an energy around it. Yeah, exactly. The taboo. Exactly. It's like the forbidden fruit. The for, don't yeah. don't go in that door. Well, and now course, all I want to do is go in that door. That's where I'm going. So you actually, <laughs> exactly. yeah, it makes it worse. So I've I've been to those I've been to a beach in Nice, France, and mm-hmm. topless and it was it more than just topless, but I mean it was there was topless women playing volleyball of all things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it's, and it's no big deal. They're there with their families. Yeah. Maybe they're there with another girlfriend. Maybe they're there with a boyfriend. Like yeah. it's just no big deal. And I was a Christian at the time, and I could feel the energy drain out of the beach that day. You know, out of my heart. 
in mind because mm. I was always just a lust, oh. you know, forbidden lust. Don't yeah. don't look, don't, don't look, think, don't, look. Yeah. don't think that thought. Mm. And the fact mm-hmm. that they were just out, just being yeah. nude and being human anatomy, it's mm. just it literally. Well, I would think so. Eventually, it just spelled it. Yeah, you would. Uh, you know, we've and seen, they, seen it before. You know, they a, say this about naturists too, uh-huh. or nudists. Yeah, nudists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, you're just yeah. standing around and talking and shooting the shit, and you're having a cocktail, and you're nude. I mean, it's just yeah. okay. So I looked yesterday in the paper. Um, there's this report about what I guess there's this artist named Marco Cochran, mm-hmm. and he does giant nude women statues like 45 foot tall whoa and he, he did a few for um burning man this year okay and he, they're trying to get one on the uh the national mall <laughs> oh oh okay 45 foot statue of a naked woman and their agenda is to do this very thing it's to to dispel the well it's kind of anti-rape culture it's anti objectification of the female body yeah yeah. and Mm. you know just like this woman saying about that magazine rack like imagine all the tourists walking around the mall (laughs) and you got this giant naked woman what about a a giant naked man though too well i mean there you go no i don't think so because we don't objectify the male body it's oh okay i mean we're dealing with a very specific issue here that men don't have like nobody's trying to rape me (laughs) You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I do. I do. I see and yet, and yet, a part of me says there should be both. I just came. I was working in Oslo, Norway, this last week, and there's a sculpture garden there. And I went for a run a couple of days, and there's just countless sculptures of nude people, men, women, children, playing, mm-hmm. wrestling. They're just doing active <laughs> things, and it's like, wow, the Norwegians really love their nude statues. And yet, there's a piece of me where it's like. We need to be more comfortable with both, yeah. even though men oh, sure. aren't objectified and, and nobody's coming sure. after you to rape you. We need to become more oh, I, comfortable yeah, totally with both. Agree. Like it's it's just it's a human body. Yeah. And yeah. I think it is the da- one of the damaging things that and it's not just Christianity. A lot of religions, you grow up with a discomfort of your body and it's not OK and it's a dirty thing and it's evil. You know, the body is evil. Well, just this notion yeah. of I control that woman i you know i i put her in a burqa or a oh you know what i mean and yeah. and she may not you may not gaze upon her just her eyes mm-hmm. and uh and, it, and it's up to her yeah. to protect me from my own thoughts it's f- up oh there we go i'm sorry <laughs> Beep. <laughs> so yeah. so yeah. i'll tell you this story right now since this has come up one of the nails in the coffin for me of feeling embracing christianity uh, per se we lived in saudi arabia for two years oh boy and we had lived in the philippines for two years i didn't i tried to go to church once it it was just nothing there so we didn't go to church at all you know through that time then we get to saudi and i had said to my husband i was like you know it'd be nice to find some sort of spiritual community i really love conversations and depth and connection that that can create Mm -hmm. so we were there about a week and we find out that some people meet in their homes the weekend there is friday saturday and on fridays they have a little gathering in their home and christianity is illegal there so people are like don't 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 say anything you know too loud or anything but it was just a nice family gathering several out of five six couples and kids and i was like this is going to be great this is exactly like singing around the living room just a conversation everybody comes from different denominational backgrounds so we'll just all enjoy being together home churches are great i mean i I always loved home churches so this is you're walking into you know think this is going to be great yeah so a few weeks into it we offered a host at our house we hosted our house and by this time i have noticed that only the men lead out in discussions so I have always been involved in any church that I am in. And if I'm going to be involved in a group, I'm going to raise my hand and say, yeah, I want to lead a discussion. Well, you're a campus chaplain. I mean, you, you've actually been in the leadership role. Yeah, yeah. So I say, hey, guys, I would love to be rotated in in leading a discussion. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I stirred the pot. So I've come to find out. Half of the couples believe very firmly that women can take no leadership role 
in a church. Right. The others didn't believe that, but the community was so important to them that they just kind of let it go. Yep. For me, I was, I, first of all, I was sitting, I'm like, we are in Saudi Arabia. If I was in any other country in the world, I could probably overlook it. But we are in the country that suppresses their women more than any other country in the world. Right. And here's a bunch of Americans Christians. who are saying, you can't lead because you're a woman. I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it just, I, I remember talking to my mom about it. I was really frustrated and upset. And, she, and my mom, she's like, well, well, where where are they from? What countries are they from? I'm like, Mom, they're all Americans. <laughs> like, Isn't that I, something? Mm-hmm. I was so upset. They actually wrote up a document. I, I'm a real influencer here. I moved them to action. The men met, had a conversation, wrote up a document. I was like, this is crazy mm-hmm. because everybody's expats. They're there for like two or three years. So the group is always going to be changing. It's not a church. I was like, I don't want to be part of a church. Like we're all adults. If you don't like what I bring up in a discussion, don't like it, right? You, I, you don't have to believe what I say. Don't let me teach your children. <laughs> I just want to have a conversation. Mm. So wow. that was one of the time I was I was so angry after that. I was just like, Christians are such terrible people. I can't. <laughs> <say> <laughs> That's close-minded for sure. Did you have you didn't have to wear a hijab or whatever they call it, the covering of your head or I guess maybe outside you did. So I don't know. I had to wear an abaya, which is I don't know essentially a a big black robe that covered all my my clothes, so it's just loose and hangy. Huh. I always kept a headscarf with me. I didn't, as a foreign woman, as a non-Muslim woman, I didn't have to cover my head. Oh, okay. but. There's always a chance when you're out and about town that you could run into the religious police and they would yell at you and tell you to cover your head and so that you'd put it on and say, Mafi Mushkila, no problem, and go on your way. And they'd go around the corner and you could take it off. Wow. Wow. I, I didn't realize you're, you're not kidding about religious police, huh? I mean, there are yeah. people that are actually policing, making sure yeah. everybody's being a Muslim. Yeah, oh, and that is, my. fortunately, that has actually declined. Uh, while we were there, the religious police, some of their authority was taken away. Oh. So mm. I just read that uh, women are now permitted to drive there. Mm-hmm. That's a big deal. Yes. That's just this week. Mm-hmm. It's a huge deal. I couldn't drive. Foreign women couldn't drive. And it's taking, It's they're planning on, it's going to be like six months before they have the infrastructure set up to be able to get women licenses and everything. It's it's very exciting for them. Wow. And all goes back to religion. Well, sure. It all takes its... And it's a step yeah. in the right direction, but I, I did see a tweet this week that the, the hashtag um, women of, you know, hashtag women of my house will not drive. Oh. Really? Yeah. It was the most, uh, you know, <sighs> popular hashtag in... <laughs> In these in Saudi, I guess. Yeah. So, well, so even though the government's saying it's a green light, the, there's still going to be sure. some some patriarchy. Yeah. Changing a law doesn't change the hearts. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll tell you, we used to talk about it when we was when we were there, and people would ask me if if you could drive here, would you? Because the driving is dangerous. It's incredibly offensive and fast, and there's fatal accidents all the time. Hmm. Nobody follows rules. And I said, yes, absolutely, I would drive here if I could. But there are a lot of women who wouldn't. And there's a lot of Saudi women who will still choose not to drive, Mm -hmm. partially because that's the belief structure that they have been brought up with. That's the the worldview that they have and that they shouldn't drive. There's some that absolutely will. And yet we'll see some. It's easy to blame it on the men, but there's some women who will still choose not to drive themselves. Yeah, 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 I get you. So what what took you to Saudi? My husband and I are diplomats, so we travel around and work at the embassies in these different countries. Okay. So, American diplomats? like Yeah. No, I didn't know that. I've never met a diplomat. How do you do? I'm shaking your hand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, telephonically here or something. But yeah. Yeah, that's, that's outstanding. You're an American diplomat. I think that's great. Thank wow. you. And Goodness. one of the few American diplomats that's ever been struck by lightning. <laughs> yes. When I read that in your bio, I went, what? you got to tell me about this. 
We like to do a lot of outdoor activities and we like to rock climb and climb mountains. And in the summer of 2015, we had a 10-day trip to France from Saudi Arabia. We did a bunch of hiking this one day. We had this mountain in mind. You had to hike way up to about probably 10,000 feet elevation. And then there's this enormous rock formation at the top of the mountain that you climb. So we get into our harnesses and we're all roped up. And it, it wasn't really difficult climbing, but you still were roped in, tied in. We're making our way up. A beautiful day, but we had gotten a late start because we had we were in France. We had a little too much wine the night before. <laughs> so we had a, a late start. <laughs> and we're up here on this rock, completely exposed. You're just looking. You can see, you know, Mont Blanc off to the left and these other peaks, like, stunning. You're in the Alps. All of a sudden, I hear this rumble of thunder in the distance, and I look over to the left, and there's some dark clouds gathering. And I'm like, oh, that's not good. But there's nothing we can do at this point. We just have to keep going. So next thing we know, there's a few drops of rain, which is also not good because the rock gets slippery when it rains. And yet still, we're like, okay, we just got to keep going. So my husband's leading the climb. He's like, well, I'm going to go as far as I can. And then he has to wait for me to follow and catch up. And I'm sitting on a part of the rock that is almost like uh, the back of the horse. And so I'm straddling it. I have my hands on the rock in front of me. And all of a sudden, I feel what feels like a rock hit the back of my helmet and it felt electric because I felt it spark to my backpack. And at the same time, up where my husband was, probably about 100 feet in front of me, a little bit higher, I see this bright flash of light. I'm sitting there on the rock. I look at my hands and through my mind goes, I was just struck by lightning. And then the next thought was like, am I still alive? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. I'm still alive. Like I literally looked at my hands, wiggled my fingers, which are tingly. And then my husband yells down to me, I think I was just struck by lightning. And I said, "Uh, yeah, I was too. And so his side of the story felt the same sensation, like a rock hitting the back of his helmet he heard this super loud clap of thunder, I, which I don't remember hearing. I just remember seeing this bright light at him. And so here I am on this rock. We've been struck by lightning, and there's no choice but to, to keep going. So the next thing I say to myself, you can't freak out, Lisa. You can't freak out. you got to keep your head. Wow. you got to keep climbing. So I'm shaking, physically shaking. Sure. Keep climbing. Fortunately, it's not very difficult climbing. It was not pretty climbing, that's for sure. And I, I make it to my husband, and we, we have a video. Okay, John pulls out the camera and starts a selfie video, and I was like, "What are you doing? I just want to get off this mountain." But it's so great now because we we have a video of this, and he's saying, "So we were just struck by lightning," and I'm saying. All of our friends who think we're crazy, we are definitely crazy. (laughs) We are crazy people. (laughs) Wow. We got to a part where we could start walking down. And it was the choice at that point that you keep climbing up to the summit or walking down. And obviously, we're walking down, right? (laughs) Except for John looks up at the summit and he says, Lisa, it's, it's not that hard. It's right there. And I was like, John, we were just struck by lightning. We are not going to test fate anymore. We are getting off this mountain. And so we start down. It's just this big, long scree slope that we're going down. And the rain just starts coming down in buckets. It starts hailing on us, completely drenched. Takes like an hour to get down to this refuge where we stop and we tell the story. And they don't believe us because (laughs) these Americans don't know how to speak French very well. So I'm sure they're not telling us Uh what we think they're telling us. Wow. Yes. Well, did you have the did you have the sense that God was trying to tell you something? <laughs> so funny that you asked this story, right? Because on the way up the hike in, John and I were having this big fight, and I was an emotional wreck. I was in the middle of training for an Ironman, and I was having a hard time hiking up the mountain. I was like, oh, I can't do this Ironman. I don't know what I'm doing. And I was mad at him, mad at everything. Then we get on the climb and all of that just disappears because you got to focus on the climb. And then on the way back down, I'm like, it's like God was smacking us upside the head and telling us to stop fighting. <laughs> so, <laughs> I did say that at the time. Were you wow. Christians at the time? Um, 
you know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, you ask, like, we both, so my husband grew up Seventh-day Adventist as well. And so for a long time, we both, and he was declared agnostic long before I was. And we, but we both really for a long time felt, oh, I mean, we grew up with a Christian worldview. I mean, how do you sure. stop yeah. being Christian? It's so, your like, mother tongue. Right, right. So you were 28 when your first husband died. How long, be- be- you know, before you found your new John. love? He was four years before John and I started dating. Did you say four? Four, yeah, after Eric died. How long have you been married? We have been married six years. Okay. Hmm. Cool. What is the role of a uh, diplomat? Diplomat. <laughs> Yeah, so my husband has the full-time position. I do training for the embassies, so I have a part-time training job, and he has an economics background, and foreign service officers serve in our embassies and our consulates around the world, and essentially, there are liaisons between the country's government and businesses in that country, American businesses and foreign businesses who want to work with the U.S., and it's where our a lot of our foreign policy comes from. Is the diplomats around the world are in communication with these various countries' governments and mm-hmm. sharing back to Washington what they're doing and thinking and having the the day to day conversations. How's that? How's that going with Trump? <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting time to be representing <laughs> the U.S. government abroad. I bet. Um, it's a difficult time, I'll be honest with you. It's noticeable, the difference of how people treat us as Americans. How so, so have you served under many presidents? or Just Obama and now Trump. Okay. Right. Yeah, he doesn't. He's not held in uh, Trump. I mean, is not held in very high esteem in Europe. around the world. Around the world, yeah. certainly in Europe. Yeah, I mean, well, you yeah. can see Middle East too. Yeah, at, yeah, you name it. You're right. Yeah. So you have to deal with. So you know. So you're standing there, and they have a feeling about Trump. So you're going to get it because you, you you're the one in, in the way right now. They're going to tell you a few things, I guess, huh? Yeah, and you have to try and be diplomatic and listen and we had it was very interesting before we left saudi so it was before the election but everything was in full swing with trump and hillary Mm. we went to diplomatic event i think at the belgian or dutch embassy and some guy my husband introduces him he says yeah you know from the american embassy this guy looks at him he says i'm sorry and turns and walks away wow yeah and later on, they ended up talking and having a very interesting conversation. But that it's it's hard when you're representing your country, and that's the that's part that's of the, the reaction. Yeah. What, what yeah. nationality was that guy? I believe he was European. I mm-hmm. he was either Dutch or Belgian. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, that's tough. So everybody's uh, no matter where you are in the world, you're you're being touched by you know. What's what's happening in this country? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Yeah. So you're you're okay now. You're in a good place and you're you know, you're a diplomat and uh, you're agnostic <laughs> for, the, for the time <laughs> being anyway. <laughs> what's uh what's next? I mean, for me it's a continual process. I think some of the other aspects that I'm in the midst of with my deconversion process is dealing with a lot of guilt or recognizing the guilt that comes with this change in beliefs. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because there's a fairly small group of friends from, you know, where I lived in the past that I feel guilty. I feel like I let them down by my beliefs. I was a strong Christian leader. I influenced a lot of people. I loved, I preached sermons. I loved to give talks. And so, to step so far out of that circle and that belief set, I feel a lot of guilt. I read an essay by Elizabeth Gilbert a couple of years ago called mm-hmm. Tribal Shaming that has helped me name this and understand this. But she talks about how tribes, you know, groups of people, it could be families, it could be church groups, it could be any number of types of groups, mm-hmm. 
shame the members who leave. And it's so painful for the member who steps out of that. And I felt it in a small way when I resigned from being a pastor for the church because I was I was part of the club. And then next thing I know, the doors closed. I still wanted to be involved in a volunteer capacity. And I pretty much was just shown the door and said, thanks, but no thanks. We're good. See ya. And I was really frustrated with that. And I remember saying to myself, like, this is not how you keep young people in the church, which is a really important thing these days, especially, well, I don't know if it's in other denominations, but Adventism is always like, how can we keep our young people in the church? Oh, sure. And I'm thinking this is definitely not the way to do it. (laughs) So the idea of this tribal shaming, the guilt that comes along with it, it. It's amazing. It, you know, there's subtle ways that it happens, but then there's very obvious ways like the Amish shun people who leave or I have friends who were Mormons and then they leave the Mormon church and families disown them. Mm. And, you know, you think excommunication, that's a religious word, right? That comes from, again, right. this religious world. And it's just so terrible and it's lonely. And then tribes are really wonderful. And I saw the church doing this so well when people come back. They're just welcomed, you know, because people get lonely. They're out there on their own, and they sure. may or may not believe, but they get lonely. They miss the community. They have no connections, and they come back, and then, oh, the lost sheep has returned to the <laughs> prodigal, fold. prodigal son. So yeah. wonderful, the prodigal son, mm-hmm. and I, it's 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 interesting to experience some of that. I shared the tribal shaming essay with some friends of mine who grew up Adventist but had left the church, decidedly left the church Mm. uh, years ago. And my one friend just said she wept reading it because she experienced so much of this. And it bothers me that this entity that is supposed to be about love and acceptance causes so much rejection and disconnection Mm -hmm. in the world through this, their approach and, Yeah, so, you know, naming that and and recognizing that I'm changing, and the reasons why I change are reasons, I didn't choose a lot of things that happened to me, I'm Mm -hmm. reacting and choosing my pathway forward in this world. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of what shifted my, kind of that really personal relationship with God came with my exposure to the developing world, Mm -hmm. and I've traveled to so many places where the vast, vast majority of people live in severe poverty. They always will. Mm. And growing up in the U.S., I had an idea that the world is really developed, by and large. Like, sure, there's a few countries in Africa that still have a ways to go, but by and large, the world's developed. And since I've traveled, mm-hmm. it's not true. Uh, the world is, it's not true. Mm-hmm. It is it is not true, and it's really struck me. And I I hear people praying now, and I used to be the person praying for a parking spot close to the door <laughs> at the mall, right? Mm-hmm. I You pray for somebody's dog. Obviously, we pray for people, but we pray for all sorts of things. And I look at these people around the world, and I'm like, how does God – distribute answers to prayer because these people here sure aren't getting their share. (laughs) And I've come to a place where I just, you can't make sense out of all that. There's so much inequality. There's so much suffering around the world that this idea of a God who's all in control and, and the, the people after the hurricanes, I have friends who are like, Oh, I'm so grateful God protected my house and my boat. And I'm like, yeah, but what about the people who, yes. yeah, you yeah. know. like, uh, Yeah, I know. Hopes and dreams, hopes and prayers. I hear that like a parrot over and over again. On and Facebook I, or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah hopes and prayers. You, you have my prayers. Well, that's not enough, you know, to tell well, you the doesn't, truth. It doesn't work. No, I mean, you know, get up and do something to help or p- p- pitch in some money or something. But prayers, and and once you kind of realize, you know, my God, the world is chaos. It's just chaotic. 
There is no intercessionary being that's going to come and change things. You got to well, do it if you want to exactly, change it. You know. Exactly. That intercessionary being can be you, can yes. be your neighbor, can be, yeah. yeah. And that's that's the other piece, you know, religiously growing up Adventist, the, uh, there's a big focus on heaven and the afterlife. Hmm. It's okay if you have a miserable life here because you're going to go to heaven and you're going to have everything there. It's going to be wonderful. Years ago, I struggled with that. And I was like, wait a minute. The Bible actually says eternal life begins now. So, then the kingdom of heaven is here. Shouldn't we be taking care of ourselves here? And I saw friends who would stay in miserable, abusive marriages because I can't leave them because God told me I have to stay. And it's okay because I'll go to heaven. And and it, it's it's just it's crazy it's really and damaging really damaging yes, yes absolutely let me ask you this about your faith because you you mentioned that it it proved to be a salve for your the death of your husband and it, it kind of helped you get through things but our, the the notion of heaven helps a lot of people deal with their hard life here because they're promised mm-hmm. a better life there mm-hmm. and um i mean has there been any kind of shifting in you as far as maybe thinking that you're going to see him again someday, and then now you don't? Thank you for asking that question. It's very interesting because it's a prominent point in my reflection on my deconstruction. Mm-hmm. When I when Eric died, I very much believed I'd see him again in heaven and things like that. And that comforted. somewhere, Yes. Somewhere along the line, I realized I would be perfectly okay if I never saw Eric again. And it wasn't, I mean, no bad feelings, no hard feelings, no malicious. It was just a, a neut- neutrality of saying, I had a really nice life with him. He influenced me in really wonderful ways. I grew. I was challenged. I wouldn't have chosen to go through all this. But given that we did, my life is richer and the growth that it spurred me to, like, it, I'm, I'm, I can be thankful for that. And I just had this peace like i'd I'd be totally fine if i never saw him again and i don't know where that came from but that was really significant because that moves me away from this religious belief of oh somebody dies how could you ever get through losing a loved one if you didn't know that you were going to see them again in heaven Hmm. and all of a sudden i was like i i'd be okay like i don't know what happens after you die but if i never saw him (laughs) it would be okay i mean one of the cognitive dissonances for us Christians when we were in it and then on maybe a catalyst for getting out was that we we signed up to the love club we signed up to the <laughs> that you know to unite people and to mm-hmm. build relationships not divide and yet yeah. we kept seeing over and over again how divisive these not just our religion but all religions and 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 so um a couple of weeks ago, we were taping a show. Uh, Dave Warnock was the co-host, and uh, he was just enthralled in this wall of quotes. Right. And uh, he took a picture of it, put it on Facebook, right. and people For those were like, who don't know, we have a wall of quotes. Yeah, it's just a big just in front of us here. Big collage of okay. yeah. of quotes and pictures, and there's celebrities and yeah. stuff. And and one of them was Frank Sinatra, and, and on the Facebook site, somebody said, "What's Frank Sinatra got to say about atheism?" <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, yeah, but, but it's does, per- it's pertinent here because of what you just said, and uh, the quote is: "Christ is revered as the Prince of Peace, but more blood has been shed in His name than any other figure in history. You show me one step forward in the name of religion, and I'll show you a hundred retrogressions." Frank Sinatra yeah. said those words, uh, supposedly. Yeah, because you know it's Frank troubling. Sinatra. You know. It's troubling. I read. I'm reading a book called Self Compassion right now that is phenomenal and one of the things she's actually quoting another author who's a buddhist woman tara brock and she talks about when we believe that we have nothing good in us it separates us from other people it makes us withdraw into ourselves and it creates these separations i'm like yeah but that's that's the theme of christianity you're not you're not good enough you're there's nothing good in you yeah and it it's it blows my mind now that I'm at this point in my life and journey of like, it creates so much disconnection and rejection and loneliness, even though it's designed 
supposedly to bring people together. And and granted, a lot of churches do a lot of good things with community, and yet that perfection, that drive for I I've got to become a better person, I have to be perfect like Jesus. It's unhealthy. I think it's damaging. It creates anxiety and depression. And to realize I'm a good person. I have good things in my life. I have good things to offer. And even when I was very much in the midst of the church, I would question this because I was like, it doesn't make sense because you're saying there's nothing good in me. But the Bible says that Jesus lives in me, and Jesus is good. So doesn't that mean there's something good in me? Like, hello. <laughs> well, only <laughs> then. Not adding up here. <laughs> yeah, only then, though. He's the only good in you. That's what we believed is that there was no good in you, but and that's why you needed to yeah. to have your badness replaced with His goodness. I'm now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. You know. So yeah, yeah. and it, and and I think what we're I mean, this is really really destructive because. Just by definition, you will withdraw from others if you feel this way about yourself. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a psychology there. I'm sure there's research to prove that. Um, by the way, I'm a huge Tara Brock fan, so oh, just drop that her. out there. And I yes. recommend her podcast, and it's B R A C H Brock. Uh, okay, yes. fantastic. Yeah. Anyway, here's the thing about heaven and hell. I mean, it's been the theme of this episode, so I'm just going to go back to it for a second, and that is. If, you know, I'm glad, I'm so glad to hear you say, Lisa, that you were like, wait a second, he's going to keep people alive just to keep torturing them? I mean, the concept is the most horrible, corrupt, evil imagination that ever hit the human mind. Yeah. So it does great damage. So if you're in line at Walmart or you're, you're anywhere and you're, you're meeting people that aren't Christian and you are, you have to compartmentalize that person like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because otherwise, you're going to have to actually deal with the cognitive truth of them being tortured forever. Ten thousand years go by, and we're just getting started. Yeah. So oh, you're, that'll f- you up, and so you have to distance yourself from that person mm-hmm. yeah. emotionally, maybe even subconsciously. And it's yeah. because of you felt like you were bad inside. Now you're justified by Christ's blood. They don't have Christ's blood, so they're still unjustified. They're going to burn in hell, and I have to separate myself from it. Wow. It's it's the worst thing to ever happen to human society. What what do you say to people who say, well, you know, yeah, I don't believe, but um, I'm going to bring my kids to have them grounded. I'll bring my kids in to get them grounded. <laughs> yeah. How do you how do you react to that, Lisa? I I believe my parents did the best they could. So I look back on my childhood and yeah. I. Sure, I have some issues, but my parents were loving and, and did absolutely the best they could. My husband, John, he grew up as a pastor's kid. Dad is a pastor, and as an adult, he says, I wish I was brought up agnostic. I wish I was brought up open to various beliefs. Mm-hmm. I know more people at this point in my life with kids who are not taking their kids to church, even if they did grow up in church, because they want their kids to have a bigger picture. They just want to bring their kids up as kind and loving human beings. Accepting. And it, yeah. Yeah. And if they choose something, great. But I will say that these these people that I'm referring to right now, the majority of them are ones that I know who are not living in the U.S. And I, I think that a lot of my friends from high school from college that connected with on facebook don't stay in close contact with Mm -hmm. it surprises me sometimes because these are people who didn't care about church at all back then now they're taking their kids religiously Hmm. i don't have kids so i can only say so much yeah yeah i get it (laughs) yeah but i i I think i would uh, i would not take kids to church i would go now yeah, I would, I, would, I, I would love on them and explain things to them and say, eh, let's talk about Buddhism. You know, there's a lot of people that believe this. Let's talk about that. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, just critical but thinking sort skills. Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and kids, I remember I was five when my grandfather was killed unexpectedly in a car accident. And I oh. remember very specifically the memory of after his funeral asking my mom, will grandpa be in heaven? And she was surprised that I was asking, and she's like, yeah, why are you asking? And I said, well, I never saw him in church. And she (laughs) explained to me that he had, you know, hearing problems, and he, you know, just didn't go for that. I still, to this day, I don't know if she just told me that because I was a five-year-old, and she didn't (laughs) want to scare me with saying he's not going to be there, or if that's the case. But at five years old, 
that was the question that I was worried about. And mm. I have a friend who she used to be a Mormon and is not now. And her kids, when they were smaller, they were still going to the church. And her daughter from very young was like, mommy, this is kind of weird. And mommy, why are they saying this? And she was like, I'm, I'm getting my daughter out of here. Mm. It's, I mean, because kids just pick up on it so quickly and right. so young. Oh, so impressionable, yeah. Absolutely. They'll pick up yeah. something. And, and it's permanent. Like, it's going to yeah. shape. It's a, it's their formation. Yeah. And you have yeah. to deform that after yeah. a while. And you I'm, are deformed afterwards, I promise. I am actively working with a counselor on that myself. <laughs> yeah. Right. Is that right? Sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I, I'm working on a story about a, a kid who... Uh, you know who believes in hell and he's eight years old he's traumatized traumatized by it yeah and what is what do you do if you're a child that uh, actually believes the presence of this terrible place that's how does this work out in your life you know and uh yeah interesting huh well on a lighter note yes some of the things we grew up with Mm -hmm. recently I realized that I I feel guilty when I drink coffee because what? Adventists Adventists teach that caffeine is bad. There's there's the health message of the Adventist Church. And growing up, I was taught that caffeine is bad, so coffee and and everybody drinks it anyway. But I would only drink it on special you know occasions or a couple times a week. If I drank it too too many days in a row, I'd be like, oh, I need to not have coffee for a week. And I realized that this is part of this religious belief system that I was brought up with and I was telling my friend and she was just like there's all kinds of studies that say coffee is good for you like what's the yeah. problem I was like yeah whatever I know but I'm still with this and she said to me she's like Lisa do you enjoy it do you enjoy sitting down and have a cup of coffee and I was like yeah I I do and then I was like I'm having a cup of coffee every day this is therapy for me and for the last four weeks literally it's just been the last month I've been drinking coffee every day. How about that? Well, you know, the Lutherans <laughs> pound it down. I'm telling you, they drink <laughs> gallons of it. So it has, you know, the Seventh-day Advent is not so much, though, huh? Mm. Wow. <laughs> well, they, they're not supposed to, but they, they drink coffee. <laughs> I'm sure they do. <laughs> How can you not? Starbucks are everywhere. You know? but see, and I have to we have to fit in the word agency in each show, yeah. show, and that was it. That's the moment of agency when you're actually asking yourself, do you enjoy it? You know? Yeah. Yes. Does it hurt anybody? Well, well, it's yes. kind of good for you. And do I, I mean, like we're talking about the I of mm-hmm. existence. Like this is existential for a Christian to ask yeah. themselves, what do I want? Because, uh, we're, yeah. But when you're a Christian, you're, you're really supposed to surrender your will over to the will of God. So you'd be asking, does the Holy Spirit want me to have coffee right now or something like that? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Just, you're a Absolutely. puppet. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's one of the things that my counselor just in the last eight months has helped me realize is that I don't pay attention to what I want. I don't pay attention to how I feel. Mm -hmm. And I I didn't even realize it because it's just natural. It's just ingrained and it comes from my Christian religious upbringing. And I I didn't make the connection ever before. Mm -hmm. And I've made that connection and it's liberating and so free and just it's almost like this wonder that i have of like wow i can really just pay attention to how i feel right now and if i want that or if i don't want that or if i whoa this is fantastic (laughs) (laughs) that's outstanding you know we laugh but it's it's not funny no no i know and i'm proud of you and congratulations you're it's like you've dialed in your radio frequency to yourself and you and it's been blasting all these years but because you were tuned to a different station you didn't even know it and now hey the music's great you know (laughs) at this station which is me yeah, I'm broadcasting yeah. and I'm That's listening. Right. Yeah. The music of the music of you, That's <laughs> and right. to give myself give myself permission to say no. That's a that's a significant thing. Yeah. I was re- mm-hmm. you know that Christian mentality. You be a submissive Christian wife. You need to submit to your husband and blah 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 blah. And to feel empowered of I can just say no, and I'm. 41 years old, and I'm finally coming to terms with this. It takes yeah. a while. So, Lisa, was your marriage to Eric patriarchal? Yes. Okay. So, there, yeah, there's a lot of baggage there. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, well, normally at this point, we go into, like, what do you do for fun? And, and yeah. you've already talked about your rock climbing, and you put in your bio that you've uh, paragliding, uh, scuba diving. You're an adventurer. Yeah. And um, instead of going down that and just repeating that, because we 
already yeah. know that you're an adventurer. There was one adventure on, I suppose, your honeymoon with John, where you had another near-death experience. Oh, that's right. So, most people go to resorts and nice, <laughs> warm, sandy places where people bring them nice drinks with umbrellas for their honeymoon. Mm-hmm. We got married on Ocracoke Island in the Outer Banks. Nice. And oh, British we, Columbia? No, that's in the North Carolina. Yeah, That's in uh, North Carolina. Okay. But then we yeah, flew Carolina. out to Seattle. John's grandmother had a house on a gorgeous isolated lake in British Columbia. She was back east for our wedding. We went to her house for our honeymoon. Hmm. So we just spent some time on the, the lake, hiking, being around. And then we had four and a half, five days we were trying to decide what to do, and we decided to go on this canoe trip that would take normal people would take eight to ten days. We did it in four days, and it's a circuit of lakes and rivers that goes in a circle in the British Columbia wilderness, and beautiful, spectacular. We saw a moose. Fortunately, we didn't see any bear. Beautiful first couple days of weather. You're just paddling down these mountain lakes. It's smooth. It's calm. It's gorgeous. I'm not a big fan of canoeing. It was on my honeymoon that I said to John after we're canoeing for about five hours one day. It's like, did I ever tell you that I don't like canoeing that much? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. He's like, "Uh, now's the wrong time to bring this on me. So third day, we're going up this lake. And the wind is coming at us, and the wind is so strong that there's waves forming on this lake. And the waves are crashing over the front of the canoe onto me. I'm in the front, flooding the canoe. John's in the back. The wind is so strong. You put your paddle in, and it feels like you're putting into concrete. And you pull, you know, the canoe moves forward a foot, and then you let it out, and the wind blows you back two feet. Mm. So we have to pull out this rocky coast on the beach and the canoe we have to try and keep it from getting battered against the rocks we'd be out there in the middle of the wilderness nobody to rescue us and it's miserable and it was during this time that john loves to quote me saying this is not what i wanted to do on my honeymoon (laughs) i'm gonna bleep that out (laughs) yeah so we get through this day and We have a peaceful, calm evening. It rains just a little bit. We wake up in the morning. You're looking out at this beautiful Rocky Mountain. There's been snow up on the top or it was rain down where we are. It's just gorgeous, spectacular. One more huge lake to cross to get us back to our car, back to our vehicle. And the wind is now blowing behind us. And so normally it's recommended that you go around the edge of the lake and stay close to the shoreline. It's getting later in the day. And John says, what do you think about cutting straight across the middle of the lake? The wind's behind us. It's obviously going to save us time. We'll get in before dark. I said, all right, let's go for it. So we're paddling and the waves are getting bigger and bigger. And so the canoe starts to surf the waves. So the front of the canoe comes up so high that I go to paddle and I'm just, my paddle's in the air because my, the front Uh of the canoe is up so high and then it comes crashing down. And these waves are so big that the canoe could at any time, if John, and he just start, he stopped paddling. He's just steering. If we got just slightly off to the side, we were going over. It was so close. He has a Hmm. GoPro on his head this time. So we have the whole thing on video as well. Oh, and. Probably about 30 minutes, we were crossing this lake, surfing these waves, and just at any moment, both of us knew, the canoe would go, we'd flip over, we'd have to leave all our stuff, we'd just have to swim. And each wave that took us a little bit closer to shore, I in my mind, I was like, okay, well, that's one less stroke that I'm going to have to do. It's cold, too. The water's cold. Mm. We're worried that we're going to capsize out here and be lost nobody's gonna know we're out here nobody's gonna find us eventually we make it across the wave is so big right as we're coming up to the shore in the video you can literally see the wave crashing over john's shoulders and he's 6'3 so he's a tall guy crashing over his shoulders completely flooding our canoe and we jump out pull it up on shore and kiss the ground (laughs) and (laughs) i decided at the time, it wasn't a, a great uh, excitement to be doing this on my honeymoon, but I've decided since then that 
taking a trip where your lives literally depend on each other on your honeymoon is not such a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say that's a bonding experience for wow. sure. Wow, absolutely. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, <laughs> and we've had the privilege of traveling all over the world together now and seeing crazy places in the world and really feel privileged. Yeah, that's amazing. It. Yeah, I, I, you you live an amazing life, <laughs> and I'm I'm sure I'm not the only one that's jealous right about now, as far as our listeners are concerned. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. No, I'm you're not. Just, you're not just, jealous. Just, no, no, I'm I am. fine. If if well, that's what Lisa wants to do, you go, Lisa. That's fine. And here's the thing that's interesting about that, and I I'll, I'll just say this: it is just recently that I have given myself permission to recognize that I live an awesome life because. <laughs> My Christian upbringing is you don't say you have an awesome life. Mm -hmm. You don't acknowledge that. It is a beautiful thing to be able to sit back and say, I really do have an awesome life. It's amazing. <laughs> well, let me, let, me, let me contrast that, though, because I think that that could be confusing for the listener, maybe, because as a Christian, you are supposed to say, I have a wonderful life, but it's blowing smoke up your own ass. Because right. God, God would not give me a bad life. You know, you kind of have to tell yourself God is good. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could yeah. have suffering all over your life, and you could be miserable, and and which we all yeah. are. Yeah. And and yet, as a Christian, you kind of have to paint you know lipstick on that pig. And then <laughs> what? But I hear you saying is, with eyes wide open, no smoke up your ass, you are literally looking honestly at your life and acknowledging mm -hmm. its goodness. Yeah. And that's different. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just letting it be good and not a, ascribing that goodness to some other yeah. entity external to myself. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's great. That's the way to do uh, it. I, I want to go back to something because I know my the thing I say on every show is be a yes say or what is. And I, I have to unpack this all the time because it's confusing and it's what mm -hmm. do you mean. And I read the Boundary Book, which is a Christian book, by the way, but it but it's it did establish like the the power of no, mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. just being a, a a doormat that anybody can walk over. Mm -hmm. You know, when somebody pushes up against you, they need to feel your substance mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. exist, and sometimes that's a no. Mm -hmm. And I really am a firm believer in never do anything you don't want to do because it just fosters resentment. Right now, mm -hmm. that, now that's complex too because I I don't want to go to work, but I do want to eat. <laughs> so I'm yeah. yes, I'm still it. doing what I want, and yeah. and it, but it's also a place where resentment can happen. But anyway, you one of the things you said earlier is that you're learning to say no, and I I just think of that as boundaries as well. But that is a place of maturation in your journey. It sounds like. Are you familiar with my yes saying philosophy? I hear you say it a lot. <laughs> I would story. welcome you to further unpack it for me. Okay. Well, it's basically just instead of looking at the harshness of life, and I mean like what Bob was saying earlier about chaos, mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons that religions exist is that we're horrified that we're alone in the universe or that we're just a, a dirt clod hurling through space. Mm -hmm. There's no yeah. meaning or purpose. Nothing happens for a reason. It's actually just random chaos. And and that doesn't feel right to the human being. And so we tell ourselves a story, you know, yeah. as opposed to just saying yes to reality. So you look mm -hmm. at your body and you don't like your hips or you don't like your hair or you don't like your this or that and you're disgruntled and and maybe even bitter uh, about the you know your your life circumstance or whatever. Yeah. It's just the opposite of whining and complaining is saying yes to what is. Now it's always has to be supplemented with the yes and so when there is a situation where you don't like your body and you say yes to it, I think that's step one to like just getting comfortable in your own skin, you know, or getting comfortable in your own chaotic universe. Whatever it is for you to stop deluding yourself with lies mm -hmm. that that kind of comfort your babiness and keep you infantilized. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. In order for it to grow up, you're going to have to say, you know what, life's hard, da-da-da, and be a yes-sayer in that sense. Now, the yes and is that if you – and this is kind of the no. Like it, it's, <laughs> it's, if you're in a situation that you don't like, yeah, you've said, yes, it exists. You haven't buried your head in the sand or covered your ears, la, 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 la. You've, you've <laughs> said, yes, this is happening. Right. And you, you are empowered to do something or get yourself out of that circumstance. But I appreciate you sharing, and I resonate with so much of what you're saying because 
as you're saying it, I what comes to mind is it was so much simpler in so many ways when I thought I knew all of the answers. And I had this nice structured set of boxed beliefs that provided an answer to everything. Mm-hmm. And now, I, I living in the space of I don't know, right? Mm-hmm. There's so many things I don't know, I can't explain. In a way, I resonate with saying yes and with recognizing I can say, yes, my life is awesome. And yes, I have incredible challenges. Moving to a different country every couple of years is not easy, takes an emotional toll, takes a relational toll. There's a lack of depth of community because you're constantly being uprooted. And I'm coming to a place where I can say yes to that. And yes, it's wonderful. And yes, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. And yes, the the world is full of situations and circumstances that we can't explain. And yet by being a yes sayer, I stay engaged in it rather than withdrawing from right. it exactly. and trying to hide from it. Right. That's totally it. You got it. <laughs> Honestly, it's 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 you you don't shrink. Did I pass back. did I pass your test? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a certificate of completion <laughs> right. in the mail. You get but yeah, it's it's not star. it's not operating from cowardice or fear. It's saying yes and going forward. Now it has a lot to do with circumstances beyond your control, and that's where the yes and comes in. Because so it's something you can control, something you can say no to, something you can change. By all means, do it because of agency, because of mm-hmm. empowerment, and that's what it's all about. Right. But when the circumstances are beyond your control, mm-hmm. and you continue to say no. Mm-hmm. You know, you're in denial. Especially, think think about this: the past, right? Say yes. It's you can't control it. It Say already yes. happened. You can't go back and fix it, mm-hmm. and you, and yet it will haunt you if you let it. You know, because you're like I, I resent that that happened, and in a way, you're in denial or rejection of your very life, mm-hmm. like the mm-hmm. the things that shaped you. And the the first step to getting healing is saying yes, it happened. Now what? You know, come up on into the future, into reality. I would uh, argue that the reason that you're able to right now look at your life and celebrate it and, and see its beauty, because you just listed the hardships. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's not like it's a smooth sailing, easy going cakewalk. Yeah. Uh, but the, the hole or portal by, through which you entered into that space of being able to celebrate your life was – by way of yes saying. Yeah. And to build on that, the yes saying is recognizing I'm making a choice. And I think so many people who are limited by their religious beliefs, my, I have a friend who stays in a miserable marriage because that's what she has to do. And she wrote to me multiple times that I'm, I'm stuck. I just feel stuck. And I, I finally wrote back and I said, I think you should leave him. Mm -hmm. And it freaked her out because she's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like you're supposed to be, you know, and and I said, look, you have to realize you have a choice. There's consequences if you leave him. You yeah. may not like those consequences. There's also consequences if you stay. Both are a choice. And that's that yes saying yeah. where you say, yes, I have a choice. And maybe I'm going to make a choice that has negative consequences. Or maybe I don't like any of my choices, but I still have a choice. I'm not stuck. I'm not yeah. mm-hmm. disempowered. I'm empowered to choose and yeah. face the consequences. Yeah, and in that case, she's saying yes to herself, which is yes. going to be a big no to him. And, and yeah. sounds yeah. like, well, she should. Okay, one last light question. Uh, what's your favorite ice cream flavor? <laughs> so I was one of those freakish kids who grew up not really liking ice cream. No. My whole really? family is like ice cream freaks. We'd go out for ice cream, and I'd be like, I don't really want ice cream. And they'd be like, "What? whose child are you? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> Yeah, but I love gelato, and we were just in Italy, Mm. and we had this amazing mint gelato with this dark chocolate gelato, and it was to die for. All right. Great. All right, I keep saying one last question, I keep thinking of another one. One, I promise this is the last one. So do you listen to music on your iPhone or earbuds or anything? I do. What's the last song you just played on your... uh, (laughs) <laughs> on your iTunes or whatever. Most recently, I've been listening to Jason Isbell. Okay, yeah. I like her. 
Crazy life. Wonderful wow. life. Yeah. Wonderful. I mean, hard, too. I mean, a death of her oh, first husband, absolutely. a brain cancer, and, yeah. you know. But what a story. I mean, this is this is this is gold, man. I mean, when you <laughs> it is a great we story. interview people you don't know about a subject no one wants to talk about, I found it I found it completely it, delightful. Yeah, it we're really we're is an engaging. hour and forty minutes in, and I could have just kept going. I thought she was fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And from the, the Netherlands, well, a, a young girl from Philadelphia, where Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania uh, you know, from the farmlands of Pennsylvania, and now in uh, as a, as a diplomat, as an American diplomat. In the, the Netherlands, and currently, so, currently, she's spent done some time in Saudi Arabia and other Philippines. Places, the Philippines too. I, I would say, for only being a year out from being deconverted, she yeah. is far along. Oh, absolutely! In her personal health, and you can tell she's a yeah, she's very, a healthy person. Well, she reads right. self help, and she's physically yeah. active. I mean, she was talking about earlier Christian mm-hmm. humanism. Yeah. Uh, when I was a Christian, I was really, I mean, I'd, I'd hear about humanism, and it sounded great, mm-hmm. and I didn't know what it was. So I literally went and looked it up. Yeah. And, you know, there's humanism with a capital H, you know, that's kind of a an ideology or a, yeah. an ism, you know. I mean, yeah. Or, and then there's uh, just, if you look up the word humanist, the first definition is a person having a strong interest in or concern for human welfare, values, and dignity. Hmm. And my Jesus, that, a com- humanist. that completely, I mean, that's a summary of Jesus, you know, yeah. in, in some way. So I thought, yeah, Jesus was a humanist. And I used to say that from the pulpit. I said, Jesus was a humanist. So I don't know why we Christians are all scared of humanism. Yeah. It's caring about people or whatever, you know. So, that was a stair step for me. You know, right. As far as, sort of this is more secular humanism without the… Very uh, much. And that's why they have to, like, put a… A clarification on it yeah. because it, it just in general well and the, the second definition is a person devoted to or versed in the humanities oh I sociology see. and religion and yeah, anthropology yeah. a student of human nature or affairs mm-hmm. so I mean, we're getting away from just somebody who cares about humans i mean it, right. it, it gets more specific but and also it's another at least at one point in time or in some country it, it was another word for classical scholar oh a humanist a classical scholar yeah hmm. So, anyway. Interesting. Rather than studying theology, theology, those kind of things, this is more… Well, when I hear classical, we're talking about yeah, Greek, Greek and Roman. Greek yeah. and Roman and, stuff, and yeah. He, yeah. The study of those things, yeah. those and, things that humans came up with, not necessarily yeah, the God myth, came the up Yeah, the mythical gods and yeah, such. Yeah, Interesting. You know, those mythical ones as opposed to the real ones. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. All right, man. Well, Fascinating. Good, Always good. Good talk. Yeah, yeah. We'll see you next week. All I'll right. be back. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>